Hi, my name is Arslan Khan and today I'm going to present M21 building an MMIO based security reference monitor for unmanned vehicles. A typical unmanned vehicle has a main microcontroller that is interfaced with multiple devices. Now these devices could be interfaced directly through MMIO or they could be sitting behind an external bus such as SPA, I2C or CAN which again in turn is interfaced through MMIO. Unlike traditional systems, in UV system there can be multiple vectors of threats. There could be cyber attacks, there could be physical attacks. And because of this, there could be multiple malicious agents in the system. Here we notice that all of the communication in this system must go through MMIO. Furthermore, since these systems have to interface with physical systems, these systems have to be real-time in nature. Here, real-time doesn't mean real fast, it actually means deterministic. And because of this determinism, we conjecture that any malicious activities may cause anomalies at the MMIO level. However, this was just a hypothesis. To further our hypothesis, we conducted various attacks on UVs. For example, we conducted GPS spoofing on a drone system. GPS has multiple types of packets. One such packet is the ephemeris message. The ephemeris message tells you about the orbital position of the satellites. We noticed that during GPS spoofing, we observe a higher count of ephemeris messages. For the sake of brevity, you can think of this higher count as higher IO activity. Similarly, we conducted several other attacks for UVs. And for most of the attacks, we observed an IO level anomaly. The key thing to note here is that there might be existing defenses for some of those attacks. However, none of these defenses actually cover all of these attacks. This survey, although not a complete survey of UV attacks, it was enough to convince us that we need to build an IO reference monitor for UVs. And that led to M2MON. M2MON is an MMR based security reference monitor. So to explain what M2MON really is, I have to explain what a security reference monitor is. A security reference monitor is an untemperable, non-bypassable, always invoked and available module that controls all accesses to data objects or devices. Informally, you can think of it as a gatekeeper to a particular object or a device. For M2MON, that particular object is MMIO. M2MON had various design challenges. Most UV systems have real-time constraints and low power constraints. Because of this, developers do not provide privilege separation. Furthermore, vendors do not provide MMUs and they also provide fewer execution modes. So there is no monitor mode or hypervisor mode for UV systems. Due to these things, everything inside a UV runs in the same privilege mode. There is no well-defined isolation between different components in the system. For the same reason, there is no well-defined device and driver isolation. Anything is able to access anything in the system. To top it all off, all of these devices could be smart as well. As a matter of fact, these devices could be as powerful as the main microcontroller. We are to fit the reference monitor by providing a microkernel. This microkernel does the reference monitoring for us. Now, a naive approach could be to implement this microkernel beside the rest of the components in the system in the privilege mode. However, clearly this does, and does not provide any isolation at all. One can use techniques such as software fault isolation to isolate the microkernel from rest of the system. However, existing work has already shown that this kind of design does not work for real-time system as it incurs high overhead. Instead, for m 2 we push everything from the privilege mode into the unprivileged mode, leaving the privilege mode as a safe haven for the m 2 microkernel. In this design, we can use the memory protection unit to restrict access to I.O. from the unprivileged mode. A memory protection unit is just like a memory management unit, however, it does not provide any address translation. Now, this kind of design should work. However, there's an architectural quirk that we need to talk about, and that is interrupt handling. 
By default, in most architectures, interrupts are taken to the privilege mode. What we can do here is that we can patch the interrupt handler. So as soon as the interrupt is triggered, the first thing these interrupt handlers do is that they transition back to the unprivileged mode. However, during our implementation, we found that most of the IO accesses actually come from these interrupt handlers. So moving them to the unprivileged mode incurs high overhead. So instead, we decided to keep these interrupt handlers in the privileged mode. However, this poses another challenge. These interrupt handlers that we just moved in the in privilege mode are outside the TCB of M2 mode, and running them beside the kernel in the privilege mode poses a threat to the M2 mode kernel itself. So to contain these uh, contain these interrupt handler routines in the privilege mode, we use software fault isolation techniques such as controls for integrity and data flow integrity. Using these techniques, we ensure three things. First. These interrupt handlers are not able to access M2 mode uh, data or code. Second, they are not able to jump outside the interrupt handler or outside the sandbox. And lastly, we ensure that they do not access IO directly. Using this kind of design, we ensure that the M2 mode microkernel is non bypassable. Furthermore, we ensure that no one in the system can modify the microkernel logic. Lastly, although we do not formally prove the microkernel, we do keep the TCB of microkernel really small so that it is easily evaluable. We instantiated the M2 mode microkernel to implement multiple applications so that we can detect different type of attacks against drones. The first application that we implemented was a Kalman filter. Kalman filter is used to model the physical world. Now this Kalman filter is similar to the Kalman filter that is implemented inside the flight control software itself. However, this Kalman filter enjoys all the isolation guarantees of M21 itself. Next, we implemented an access pattern based filter. This access pattern based filter track IO access frequency, it can track IO access sequences, and it can also block accesses to different IO regions. To evaluate our system, we use 3DR Iris plus UAV platform, uh, which was running Autopilot control software. Using this platform, we conducted two types of evaluation performance evaluation and security evaluation. In performance evaluation, we try to figure out how much of an overhead M21 incurs. Here on the x-axis, you see different autopilot tasks, and on the y-axis, you see log-based time scale. The bars here are the execution times. Uh, here, the thing to note is that if a task was not missing its deadline before M21, it does not miss its deadline even after M21 microkernel is implemented. Overall, we incurred an average overhead of 8.85%, so roughly around 9%. Next, in security evaluation, we try to find the efficacy of M21 and its applications. If you remember the small survey that I presented in the beginning of the slides, Using m 2 one and its application, we were able to detect all of these attacks uh, using one of the detection feature or one of the applications that we implemented. As a case study, let's consider the first attack, that is the timer attack. The timer attack is actually borrowed from an existing paper called Minion. In this attack, an attacker tries to modify the tick value of a system. Since that is how a system keeps track of time, a modified tick value results in an unstabilized system or even a crash system. While profiling the timer attack, we notice that the system only modifies the configuration registers during the system boot up. And after system boot up, it never modifies or even accesses these configuration registers. However, under attack circumstances, we notice that there are multiple IO accesses to these configuration registers. When using M21, a user can register a rule with M21 that disallow any configuration changes to the system timer or the timer registers, hence avoiding this timer attack.
Empty mode comes with its own set of limitations. Most of them stem from the fact that empty mode is deployed on systems with low compute power or low resources. Due to this reason, empty mode cannot really run complex applications such as machine learning applications. Uh, as a rule of thumb, uh, M2M1 is limited by the slack time available in the system. Here we have three different tasks from ArduPilot. Uh, on the x-axis, uh, you see increased number of rules, uh, which can be construed as the increased complexity of the applications running on top of uh, M2M1. On the y-axis, you see the execution runtime, and these flat lines are the deadlines for these tasks. Uh, as you can see here, that for the auto trim task, uh, even at higher complexity of task uh, of the applications running on top uh, of uh, M2M1, uh, the task never misses a deadline. However, for update the bad compass task, uh, the task uh, misses its deadline really quickly. Uh, this highlights the difference between the available slack time uh, in the two tasks. For the same reason, uh, in the access pattern based filter application, we do block listing a lot instead of allow listing. To conclude this talk, in this uh, paper, we showed that UV attacks against drones usually exhibit MMO level anomalies. Uh, to detect these anomalies, uh, we implemented the M2M1 microkernel and we implemented multiple applications on top of that M2M1 microkernel. Uh, we showed that uh, on a real drone controller, M2M1 microkernel incurs a reasonable overhead and using the applications and the microkernel, we are able to detect a wide range of attacks. With this, uh, I would like uh, to thank you all for listening to me and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions you guys have. Thank you.